So we've come to the last speaker, and it's a good one. Um, this is uh, Kevin Flaherty from the University of Michigan. Um, Kevin has, as you heard from Zhao, recently led, among many other things he's done for the field, a trial in uh, progressive fibrosing ILD and is here to talk about it. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Hal, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak. I am the last uh, barrier between whatever you have for the rest of your evening, um, and about 80% of what I had to present has already been presented, so uh, we might get through this even quicker than, than planned. So what I was asked to talk about is progressive fibrosing interstitial lung disease. Um, is this a potential extension of, of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? So my objectives were to describe the concept, kind of how maybe this was thought about in these trials that we've heard a little bit about already, um, and then present the trials um, which uh, have already been uh, presented in large part. So thinking about if we look back decades, um, you know, many, many decades, historically, we grouped many of the interstitial lung diseases together into a, a general category called pulmonary fibrosis, as we heard about, you know, in the last session, you know, lumpers as opposed to splitters. And within those groups, there was lots of heterogeneity. Um, and that heterogeneity made it very difficult to study. Even when we studied what we ended up splitting into IPF, if you think of the first capacity trials, one was positive and one was negative, not because of the drug effect, but because the placebo arm behaved differently. So heterogeneity makes things difficult to study. And you can go back. These are really, really old data. You know, these are retrospective data of patients at the time that were called cryptogenic fibrosing alveolitis. There were subsets that were treated with variable types of, of prednisone dosing. Some of those had more detailed follow-up, and you looked at those detailed follow-up. There were some that had subjective improvement. We all know sometimes steroids make us feel better, but there was a smaller subset that actually had objective improvement. About 14% had improvements in, in measurable shortness of breath or vital capacity or chest X-ray. And if you looked at that subgroup, they were characterized by being younger, having less symptoms, and a biopsy that was characterized as cellular and less fibrosis. And if I had you write down on a card on their table what you think these people would have today, we'd probably say, well, they probably have NSIP or organizing pneumonia. They don't have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. We know that steroids in response to steroids can correlate with, with subsequent uh, mortality. This is a study that, that we published many years ago in patients that, again, were kind of a bigger group of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis before we really started splitting out UIP versus NSIP. These patients were treated with a three-month course of corticosteroids, and then their response was defined at three months by a CRP score, their, their clinical symptoms, their radiographic changes, and their physiologic changes. And you could look at, well, what happened over those three months? And as you'd expect, patients that were stable or, or responding did better than those that didn't respond. But then if you took a, a dissected or splitter look at these patients, you could see that we were able to go back and get biopsies again on 39 of those 41 patients. And 29 of them were UIP, 10 of them were NSIP. In the NSIP group, 90% of the patients were either stable or responding. In the UIP group, much more common to be a non-responder, and very few actually responded. So what did that teach us? It taught us by splitting, it could help us perhaps predict response to therapy, or at least in this case, response to steroids. And that got us where we are today, right? There's a huge emphasis on diagnosis. It helps us determine initial therapy. It helps us determine prognosis at the time of diagnosis. We just heard that. IPF has a worse prognosis than NSIP or organized pneumonia. I think it helped us with success in our clinical trials. I think the narrowing down, even though IPF still has heterogeneity, the ho more homogeneous IPF compared to all the different IIPs, I think allowed us to have success, you know, when we studied and used studied agents such as metenidib and profenadone. But also, as Ralph pointed out in the last talk, it does sometimes fail to account for subsequent disease behavior or it doesn't account for what that disease behavior, once you know it's there, means going forward. So a large emphasis on diagnosis clinically. Is there a connective tissue disease? Is there an exposure? Or is it idiopathic? And if it's idiopathic, is it idiopathic UIP, the disease we call IPF, or one of the other idiopathic interstitial pneumonias? But also written at the same time was this idea that was presented um, just the last talk about disease behavior where some of these tend to be chronic and fibrosing, 
Others may be more epidemiologically associated with smoking, and others tend to be acute or subacute. At the time of presentation, diagnosis is important, and I'll argue that it will remain important. But, uh, so in this patient, these were all IIP patients, so the UIP patients were, were idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis versus NSIP and others, and if you did a Cox regression analysis that looked at other variables that might account for prognosis, such as, as age, uh, sex, smoking history, amount of fibrosis on CT, physiologic abnormalities, et cetera, you can see that of all those things, the trump card was really the diagnosis. Having IPF versus others, your risk of mortality was 28-fold higher. But what about subsequent disease behavior? So in this study, and what I'm showing you here is actually table two from the study. Table one showed baseline characteristics. And in table one, it mattered if you had IPF versus NSIP. It predicted prognosis just in that last slide at the time of diagnosis. What I'm showing you here is table two, where now you're looking to say, okay, well, at the time of diagnosis, something happened, essentially immunosuppression. Six months later, what happened? What happened then? Whoops, wait a second. That was supposed to be highlighted, but um, what you can see is in row three, the six month change in forced vital capacity, that six month change was now predictive of subsequent prognosis. And if you look at row five, NSIP compared to IPF, it was no longer predictive. So this teaches us, or it teaches me, or what I think about this is, yeah, diagnosis matters at the time of di at presentation, but then once you're down the road, what may be more important is your disease behavior. Both are important, but important at different times in a patient's disease course. And I think that may be where we go to, not ignoring diagnosis, but factoring in diagnosis and subsequently disease behavior. And there are some paradigms for that. You know, Steve gave a great talk on pulmonary hypertension. It can be treated by lots of different, different causes. Uh, we know that in the, in the oncology world, we can target mutations. Mutations may cause malignancies in different organs, bladder, et cetera, and we're gonna target that mutation with a drug that targets it, not necessarily just a cancer in that area. So that got at this idea of, well, we had two drugs that were approved for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but we knew there were a lot of other diseases out there that seemed to have overlap in similarities to IPF, at least down the road a bit. And if we tried to study them individually, that might be really hard, and, and in some cases it might be infeasible just because of the numbers. So the idea was, well, maybe in all these different categories, some of the patients develop a progressive fibrotic phenotype. So if you look at that big circle in the center, the blue circle, it says PFILD, those are progressive fibrotic interstitial entities. It means the fibrosis is getting worse. And if you look at all the circles around it, you know, you can have other idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, you can have those associated with autoimmune disease, unclassifiable, we just heard about, hypersensitivity pneumonia. And within those groups, and these are non-proportional Venn diagrams, but you can see about some of those patient populations overlap and become progressive fibrotic. Others remain outside that circle. Whatever you did, it was HP, you found the cause, you removed it, and the patient stabilized or improved. They did not become progressive. You found an autoimmune disease, you treated them with immunosuppression, they responded, they did not progress. So within these different categories of interstitial lung disease, some of the patients will go on and progress and have a progressive phenotype, others will not. And your initial approach to those patients is critically dependent upon your diagnosis. And we can look at a couple examples. So if I just use hypersensitivity and pneumonia as an example. So our treatment tends to be antigen avoidance, um, use of immunosuppressions. Although the data we have for the effectiveness of our immunosuppressive therapy is fairly limited. And some of us will talk about, and this was presented earlier, that, that maybe in some of these uh, chronic fibrotic patients, when we're using immunosuppressive therapy, maybe it's not helpful, maybe it even might be harmful, as we learned with IPF in the Panther study. This was a patient of mine, if you look at his pulmonary function studies from 2013, he was severely restricted, had severe hypoxemia. He was no longer able, or not working at this time. His, his FBC, 38% of predicted DLCO, the same. And if you look at his CT scan, the one on the bottom left, it's got ground glass opacification. It has mosaic attenuation. So it was identified that he had doves in his home. He removed the doves, found a new home for them. 
was treated with immunosuppression. If you look at his pulmonary function studies and his CT scan several years later, he's had dramatic improvement in his lung function. His CT scan has resolved, the ground glass is gone. He's no longer on therapy, he's no longer on oxygen, he's back at work and he, he doesn't come back for follow-up anymore. He did fine. He did fine because we made the diagnosis early before it became fibrotic. This is another case that's more unfortunate. She actually presented and saw me initially with a CT scan much like that last patient. She had lots of birds in her home. The birds were removed, she was treated with steroids and initially she got better. In fact, she got so much better that she missed her birds the birds came back, and then several years later, she came back with a CT scan that looked like this. Severe restriction, hypoxemia, fibrosis, tried to get rid of the birds, tried immunosuppression, but unfortunately, the disease continued to progress, um, and, and uh, she did not survive her chronic hypersensitivity pneumonia. Same disease, different stages, acute prefibrotic responds differently than fibrotic. So what are the emerging data? And I think I'll be able to move through these fairly quickly and then maybe we'll have more time for, for discussion uh, because these have all just been uh, presented. But if you look at the, the emerging data, the recently published data of antifibrotics outside of IPF, you can look at systemic sclerosis. Um, and in the census trial, these were people that had 10% of fibrosis on CT, vital capacity greater than 40%, DLCO between 30 and 89%. If they were on stable immunosuppression, they could continue. This was a largely female population with systemic sclerosis. Age was around 55, vital capacity around just over 70%. And about half of them are receiving uh, underlying immunosuppression as they entered the trial. And as we saw in the prior session, there was a slowing in the decline of forced vital capacity in those patients that were treated with natentative compared to those that were on placebo. The relative decline, much like an IPF, was about 50% although the absolute decline, since there was less decline in this population than IPF, was smaller at around 40 cc's. The side effect profile was similar to what we see in IPF with GI diarrhea being the most common side effect. Let me skip over that. So that led to a concept of saying, you know, maybe if you have, um, in IPF we say there's abnormal injury, and over time it causes abnormal wound healing. Well, maybe the, um, if you know the injury, hypersensitivity pneumonia or idiopathic or an underlying connective tissue disease, the injury is what matters and the fibrosis could respond the same. These slides, are, I'm sorry, I apologize, they're actually out of order, but the hypothesis, and again, a little bit out of order, but that immunosuppressive therapy may be effective early prefibrosis like in that HP patient. The disease course, um, once fibrosis is present, immunosuppressive therapy may not work, it may be harmful, and these antifibrotic therapies may be beneficial. Um, I'm gonna skip through these. Um, and actually, so the, the last two slides I was gonna, our trials I was gonna present were actually already presented. Um, they were the, the Toby Myers unclassifiable, which was presented in the inbuilt trial that was presented. Um, I'm gonna stop here because actually this is the wrong slide that I think I uploaded, uploaded, so I don't have those actually data, so I apologize for that. But I do have a couple minutes for questions, so. Great, thanks Kevin. Uh, front to your left. Uh, Dr. Flaherty, Ala Abusay from Henry Ford, Hayburn, in Michigan. Uh, my question is about the inbuilt trial. Um, trying to apply the results into our patients. Uh, my question is, why did we decide to exclude patients on immunosuppression? Of course, we allowed um, putting the patients back after six months. How would I apply that for, actually, three groups of patients always come to my mind. Connective tissue disease patients with progressive fibrosis, chronic HP, and maybe even vasculitis. I just read in a recent paper about um, UIP and vasculitis, MPO-positive uh, vasculitis patients, where there is really a frustration on the response of the lungs in these patients to aggressive immunosuppression, with a recommendation at the end of a recent paper for hopefully trialing uh, placebo versus antifibrotics for them. But what I challenge myself with, how would I apply the results of the inbuilt trial to patients who are already on immun immunosuppression, especially in, in these three categories? Yeah, I think that's, it's an excellent question. It's one that when we were designing the trial, we really, you know, and how you were there, you know, at these meetings, really struggled with. Um, and the idea around excluding them was 
say, well, whatever we were doing, you're still getting worse. Um, whether or not, like if, if you look at the census data, there was a differential response to patients that were on mycophenolate versus not. Maybe, you know, those are studies that we just don't know. But the decision to exclude patients on immunosuppression was based on they're getting worse, um, and we wanted to try to have a, a cleaner study to see the effect of antifibrotic, not necessarily the antifibrotic, on top of various immunosuppressions. We also tried to struggle with, well, if we leave them on immunosuppression, what are they going to be on? You know, there's just so much heterogeneity. Uh, the decision to allow it back on at six months was kind of a rescue therapy decision. Uh, it was less than 5% of the, of the study that actually had that reapplied. It made it, the trial, as you know, accrued ahead of schedule, but I can tell you, like at our site, some of our difficulties in recruitment were patients that were getting worse, they were on immunosuppression, but they, they were wedded to it. They weren't really to, willing to come off of it because they're, well, maybe it's doing a little bit until they didn't enroll in, in the trial. So I think the, the going forward, trying to figure out what to do with immunosuppression and antifibrotics is, is something that we need to sort out. It's a really good question and, and hard to answer without data. Yeah, in the back. Hi, Kevin. Uh, it's the end of a, a long few days, but I want to ask you a difficult question. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so um, I, it's likely I'll need to design a, a future study in PFILD. Um, and obviously with BI getting breakthrough status uh, in inbuild, uh, they'll likely get a broad label uh, for the treatment of PFILD. Now, if I take you to figure S7 in the supplement of the paper, the response in the non-UIP group, and I haven't got it in front of me, is, one, is 154 mils, but the confidence intervals are extremely wide, which probably means that that response is driven just by a few patients within that group. So my question to you is, when I'm designing a future study on top of nintendinib in PFLD, what group of patients do I pick? Meaning the, those with a UIP-like pattern on CT or other fibrotic patterns, is that your How, question? Yeah, what mix do I put in? Do I yeah. replicate what they've done and power it like we've done with Isabella? Um, or do we use more UIP-like patients? I think, so when you look at the, the forest plot, that figure I think you're referring to, the statistical p-value on that was 0.23. So there, it was more consistent that it was a population effect, and none of, even though the confidence intervals were wider, part of that's because that's a smaller subset. There was about 40% of those versus 60, so just within the smaller sample size, there's gonna be wider confidence intervals, and none of them crossed over zero, so they were all you know, consistent in terms of favoring a tentative. If you look at it and you say, well, you know, it's not statistically significant, but my heart of heart, I think maybe those UIP-like patterns respond better. You could certainly design your trial that way, but you're also then hindering your trial by you've just limited, you know, 40% of the people that were in the in-build trial could have come into your trial and you're saying, no. You're saying, well, you kind of responded the same. There's no statistical evidence statistically that you'd be found different, but, but my gestalt is UIP is probably worse, so I'd like to study that. And I think that's the trade-off you'll have to decide. Um, my, my suggestion would be study the in-build population. I thought you'd say that. Thank you.